forgotten. Betrayer. Lapdog of a tyrant. No, I am the Breaker. The Hammer of Olympia. I am the Lord of Iron. Iron within. Iron without. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Rebellion, destruction and betrayal is what comes to mind with the Lord of Iron, the Breaker and the Hammer of Olympia, Primarch of the Fourth Legiones Astartes, Perturaba. But we are more than just the facades we put out to the world. Who is the Lord of Iron and why did he betray the Emperor? Why did Perturabo choose damnation? To understand who he is now, we have to start at the beginning. Like all good stories, it begins in fire. Stolen from the Emperor's side by the foul entities of the warp, the Primarch hurtled through the Immaterium. His gestation capsule hurtled through the galaxy like a blazing comet and fell upon the mountainous world known as Olympia. Bursting through his capsule, the young Primarch slogged through the amniotic fluid and oil, and for the first time, using his own legs to stand. You would expect confusion and fear to fall upon anyone in this situation, but cold, calculating calm were at the core of this child. He had awoken to a snow-topped mountain, thin air, and a crass capsule with a letter 4 inscribed upon it. Almost all the Primarchs landed on a world in panic, remembering nothing of their origins, their home, or even their name. But this boy was different. It was like the words were blazed across his soul. The boy knew he had a name, Perturabo. Though uniquely amongst his brothers, he possessed some fragments of memory and purpose. Perturabo, like all his brothers, would come to be shaped by the planet of his early life, the culture, the people and the geography over the coming years would seep into the young Primarch. Olympia is a world of unbroken mountainous terrain, crags, plateaus, temperate foliage, and terrifying monstrous beasts that resemble the creatures from Greek mythology. Humanity found this world early in the dark age of technology, leading to a mass colonization and industrial mining on a scale unimaginable to modern man. The planet grew to a place of rich mineral resources, leading to the construction of a world seeped in rich stonework, art and technology. Perhaps a true paradise in its golden age. But like all things in the grim dark universe, the best days are behind us. The age of strife began, and the colonies of man became cut off from warp travel and each other. As planets starved, Olympia managed to hold on due to its technology and temperate climate, producing mass resources, but decline was inevitable. On a world with a very terrain, isolated cities and colonies, divisions fostered. For thousands of years, each city, each fortress and town began to evolve their own cultures and traditions, and where there is difference amongst people, conflict is inevitable. Each independent city-state over thousands of years regressed. The understanding of technology was poorer. The mountainous and mined-out world had less and less resources. They had created their own unique pantheon of gods. Each city's belief as strong as their rivals. The world of Olympia had crumbled into a web of subterfuge, manipulation, rivalries and war. The people became opportunistic, pursuing wealth security and dominance above all else. At the technological level of pre-atomic bomb, the planet in the time of the 30th millennium is in a constant state of cold war. Each territory a slog of siege warfare amongst the difficult mountainous terrain. A society that rewards greed, selfishness and competitiveness is ruled by those who excel at that. As such, Olympia is ruled by petty warring tyrants. Ruthless men and women, woven amongst layers of complex political intrigue. People who only saw others as tools for their ambitions. Perturabo.
Potarava was alone. We have all felt alone in our world before, but to a level where you can't fully remember where you came from, where you have truly never even met another person before. It is possible that Perturabo felt this way, though in reality it was overrun by his instinct to survive, to adapt and learn. The young Primarch began roaming the remote mountains of Olympia. All alone he survived, thanks to his inbuilt Primarch intellect and genetics. It was during this period of primal survival that Perturabo saw them for the first time, humans. In the search for food, Perturabo had found the flocks of local shepherds high up on the mountains. Devouring their stock, the angry farmers did their best to chase him. They were weak, and they stood no chance, but yet they still tried to chase him. Actions that possessed no logic to him. As the farmers began chasing him one day from their flock, they were attacked by a massive serpentine creature. The monster attacked and began devouring an adolescent boy. Coldly, the Primarch observed them, their foolishness, and they beat the monster in an attempt to release the boy. But the boy was lost, and surely they would die if they stayed any longer. The sight was curious. As the Primarch turned, he left and felt a tug at his heart. Something in his core told him not to leave, but to help them. Why? What made him feel this way? He knew he stood no chance against the beast, and it would only put him at risk. But for a moment he felt an innate desire to protect the farmers. Like an ember, this feeling grew from a slow burn into a fire, and Perturabo resolved himself to kill the beast. But by hand, the boy's chances were pitifully low. So the Primarch trekked down from the mountains to the village of the farmers. The farmers were frightened of him, this man-sized child who had slayed their flock and used it to create ragged clothing. Perturabo, as a Primarch, began to show his otherworldliness, piecing together the sounds of what he heard from the farmers, who had chased him many times upon the mountains. He spoke. He found the local blacksmith, and his first words in the galaxy were to give him iron, coal, and tools. Fearful of this strange being, the man complied. And so began Perturabo. Knowledge flowed from him as he forged, quenched, and tempered the metal before him. The farmer's curiosity overcame their fear, as seeing the strange boy perfectly work the tooling and techniques of smithing, something that might have brought excitement and wonder to anyone. But coldness was across his face, like someone who had done this not for the first time, and it was simply a mundane task. A blade was forged, and the boy set out back to the mountains, only to return hours later covered in blood with the head of the beast. The farmer who had lost his boy to the beast approached and asked what reward he required. Reward? The boy had not done this for reward. He did it because he wanted to help. It was his purpose. Somewhere inside Perturabo, he knew he was meant to build and protect. He had the instincts and heart of a good person innocent like a child, but much like in our own world, innocence is often taken advantage of. The farmer gave him an expression that later he would come to dread, the smile of someone not looking at a saviour or friend, but a tool. Be a Primarch means to possess gifts and intellects above and beyond mortal human. The rate in which Perturabo was learning and studying in his environment is astonishing. He was stronger, faster, and likely smarter than anyone on the entire world. But when it came to social experiences, he was still a boy. Rumours of a large and powerful man slaying the serpentine beast single-handedly spread like wildfire. Perhaps on another world, or in another time, he would have been seen as a saviour, like many of his brothers. But on Olympia, power was to be tamed and abused. Damikos, the ruling tyrant of the city of Lokos, heard the rumours of this strange boy, and set out his city guard to fetch this mysterious figure. On seeing the strange boy in the flesh, Damikos put him to the test. Witnessing his ability to defeat warriors twice his size, and many times his age in combat, 
and also the boy's ability to solve any puzzle put to him by the tyrant's own scholars. Damikos was intrigued, enough to offer the boy a place at his court. Life could have been very different for the young Primarch if he had chosen another path, for Damikos, like the farmers, saw only what this Primarch could do for him, something he would see in the coming years. Perserabo was put to work, his inbuilt genius flowing forth improved weaponry and tactics, like if the very plans were inscripted on his DNA. Perturabo never discovered anything new with excitement. It was as if he was just reciting it from memory. Perturabo, over the coming years, took command of Locos's forces and began a brutal campaign of siege warfare over the planet, pumping out remarkable designs of siege engines and battle strategies. City by city fell over the decades and fell under the banner of Damikos of Locos. The Primarch's victories were incredible, but something was wrong. He had no one to share it with. The Primarch learned quickly, enough to see the pit of vipers that surrounded him in Locos. Intrigue, jealousy, arrogance and selfishness pervaded Olympian high society. Perturavo began to see how they saw him. The freak, the fool, the one to be used for their own ends. No one on Olympia loved him. Not Damikos, not one of his stepbrothers and sisters. They loved what he could do for them. His inbuilt genius was a curse. He felt no joy. He was only reciting from memory. He had never created anything from his own heart. The effects of this life was leading to scars on the inside. He was the great Perturabo, the boy descended from the heavens, veteran warrior of countless campaigns, the perfect man. There was no place for weakness. One day, during the latter decade on his time in Olympia, Perturabo challenged his foster brother Andros to a sculptural competition. The distance he had put himself emotionally meant that Perturabo saw himself as superior to everyone, and everyone in his life had reinforced that. For weeks, Andros, a mere mortal man, toyed with his work, whilst Perturabo lorded over the perfect piece he had created in a single day. The day of judgement arrived, and Perturabo showed his piece to the court, this immaculate sculpture that brought the court to tears. Its artistry was amazing, incredible even. Though he would never admit it, Perturabo bathed in the praise that he had become used to until Andros revealed his piece. It was perfection personified, the creativity, how the light played on it. It truly captures your soul. Perturabo lost. He was the Primarch. He was the genius. He was beyond human and he lost to a mere man. Perturabo destroyed the two works, smashing Andros's piece to dust. He hated it because he hated how it made him feel, because for all the genius he possessed, he was missing one thing, humanity. He had never truly connected with anyone, he never felt the joy of discovery or the humility of defeat. He raged like a child because he had never experienced the maturity that love brings. It was time. Decades of being a frontline strategist under his adoptive father, the time had come. A part of him knew he was created, his genius was no accident, and finally his creator, his true father, had come. Seeing from miles away, Perturabo rushed to the highest mountain of Olympia, perhaps for the first time in his life he had felt excitement. At the peak, he saw him, the perfect being a face of brilliance and sincerity, and he wept. My son, he said. His lips remained in that sincere expression of pleasure, the like of which Perturabo had never seen on the calculating faces of the Olympians. No words passed his lips, but still he spoke. I have found you. I... Perturabo swayed. The pressure of his father's mind was immense. The much-feared star maelstrom was nothing compared to this power. Perturabo's deepest thoughts were dragged out into the light of his soul and read as easily as words on paper. He looked down on the man, then fell to his knees with all humility. 
a quality which until this moment he had not known in himself. Father. Kneeling, Perturaba was still taller than the man, but he was left in no doubt that the strange visitor surpassed him in every way. I am the Emperor of Terror and of all mankind, said the man, now speaking aloud. His voice was calm and full of the promise of great things. You are Perturabo. I am. I am, said Perturabo. You know me. The Emperor laid a hand on his shoulder. Warriors in tall helms and golden armor were arrayed behind the Emperor. They watched him closely. You are as dauntless as I intended you to be. The Emperor looked out over the world, as if he could see the smallest detail from their lofty vantage. You have achieved much. His smile broadened with delight. I see a world of peace, filled with mighty castles and marvelous devices. We have much to talk of, and I can teach you a great deal. I sense the hunger in you for knowledge. I think you and I have many nights of discussion ahead of us. Yes, said Perturabo. Please. He was struck near dumb by wonder. Will you offer me your allegiance? Will you join with me and pledge yourself to humanity's service? The warriors in gold tensed, their weapons pointed at Perturabo. Ordinarily, this insult would have sent him into a towering rage, but Perturabo's arrogance, until then immutable as iron, melted and was swept away, and he answered meekly, I want nothing more. I swear that I shall serve you faithfully for all time. This I pledge. The Emperor looked at him with the expression of infinite wisdom. Deep in his eyes, sorrow lurked. Perturabo wished more than anything to banish that sadness if he could. Then rise, my son. The sadness was hidden away again, so that Perturabo doubted he'd even seen it, and was ashamed he could impute such an emotion to so perfect a being. Your road will be hard, but few are worthy of it, said the Emperor. I have many tasks for you. The indefatigable, the indomitable, the unrelenting. You shall be my Lord of Iron. Perturabo cried out in unbashed joy. Finally, he felt acceptance without caveat. Love radiated from the Emperor for his found son. Perturabo basked in it. For the first time, he felt a sense of true belonging. And may it forever be so. His true father had come for him. Perturabo had spent decades on a world where he was used as a tool in the army of a tyrant and now his father had come to save him from this existence. All his life he had been surrounded by vipers, the selfish nobility of Olympia, who would lord praise upon his works and accomplishments. But no one ever praised the man, Perturabo, for no one really cared enough to know who he was, and what he cared about, what he dreamed of. His time in Olympia was also confounded by fear, Long ago during this time amongst the mountains, the young Primarch had peered towards the heavens and gazed upon a strange nebulous stellar maelstrom erupting across the galaxy. Unnervingly, he found that no one else could see it. The Primarch felt at all times as if he was being watched, like something malevolent stared at him constantly, watching, waiting, judging a constant source of background paranoia that clung to him through his daily life. The expectations of genius and perfection were suffocating in Olympian high society, and he feared sharing this as it could be seen as weakness, a dangerous thing to share amongst Olympians. In fact, his entire life had reinforced this disdain, seeing the farmers too weak to defend themselves against a serpentine monster, the weakness inside the fortresses he conquered, the weakness inside him, when Andros, a mere man, beat him in competition. There was no place for weakness. By reuniting with his father, he learned of the Great Crusade, a dream to unite humanity across the stars. His father told him his journey would be tough, and he expected great things from Perturabo. 
Perhaps for the first time in his life, he had someone who he truly didn't want to disappoint. The Emperor gave him tutelage and connection, and after a brief amount of time, he was given his sons, his legion, the Iron Warriors. Potarabo was no longer just a demigod amongst mortals, now he had brothers, equals, or in some ways, rivals. He would become the strongest warrior, he would create the greatest technology, and have the greatest legion in the galaxy, because it was what the Emperor demanded. His father would see, having instituted a full review of the 4th Legion's war record, doctrines and practices, and having compared them with the other legions, Pertrower found his sons fell far from this ideal of strength. They were meant to be the greatest force under the Emperor, worthy of praise, but they were failing. They were his failure. The sons created from his own genetics were weak, and that made him look weak. His punishment was decimation. For all the Legion's failings, they would suffer. The orders were given. War is unequivocal, uncaring, unforgiving, and blind. Blind also will be the selection of those who will pay the blood price for the great failure of your record. One in every ten of the Legion, chosen at random by lottery, was beaten to death by his own comrades with their bare hands. Warriors that had fought together, shared life together, brothers who had bled together. The Legion's first encounter with their Primarch was humbling. They were not friends, not family. They were to be a machine, a tide of soul-hardened veterans. The standard, the exemplars that would be heralded as the greatest. There was no place for weakness. The Hammer of Olympia, the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, Iron Within, Iron Without. Pertorabo was now in complete command of his legion and set out upon the Great Crusade. His legion had been remade into his own image, like many of his brothers. Efficient and highly capable, siege experts but also brutal, bitter and envious. This brutal start to his command had not gone unnoticed, as many of his brothers, such as Rabute Gulliman, decried the decimation. As Astarte's warriors made for the reunification of humanity died like animals. Some had even fought by Gilliman's side before the discovery of Perturabo, and they deserved better. But Perturabo was made as the Emperor intended, cold and calculating. Numbers, technology and knowledge were coded into his very being. This made it difficult for him to connect with many of his brothers, even though deep down it was what he wanted. Perhaps his only true friend was Magnus, as their fascination with hidden knowledge created a bond of respect and innovation between them. Magnus and his sorcery, Perturabo and his technology. It was perhaps only for the Emperor and Magnus that Perturabo created gifts, something he was not forced to make, but something he had wanted to create. However, as the decades progressed during the Great Crusade, the duty and wonder that captured Perturabo upon his first meeting with the Emperor began turning to ash. Perturabo was created to build, improve and protect. He had even begun to fuse augmentics to his own brain to improve every aspect of his mind. But his very purpose was given to another, Rogel Dawn of the Imperial Fists, who received the task of fortifying the capital of Terra. Perturabo and his legion had spent a near century in constant warfare, bloody engagement after bloody engagement, slogging through conflicts so mind-numbingly apocalyptic you would be overwhelmed by it. They had cracked the toughest fortresses, they had built the mightiest bastions and outposts in the Imperium, and the task, the glory, was given to another. Did the Emperor not see their strength? Did his father not care? Did he not see how they suffered for him? A familiar feeling began to bubble under Perturabo's skin. Jealousy. Something again he could not bring himself to tell anyone, as it was a weakness. This feeling only festered over the latter days of the Great Crusade, as the Iron Warriors were constantly thrown at the worst the galaxy had to offer, bringing home impossible victories, only to then hear of the triumphs of Rogel Dawn 
Sanguinius and Gulliman across the Imperium. Hostile human federations were crushed, orc empires erased. The Legion even suffered a brutal campaign against the Hrud of the Sacterada Steeps, a region that Perturabo saw as strategically useless. Nevertheless, he dutifully oversaw the purging of the Hrud, despite his Legion's heavy casualties. The Hrud, using their unique technology, would rapidly age their enemy until nothing but dust remained. Legionaries who caught a glancing blow found their bodies rapidly aged and falling apart. Perturabo even himself suffered a blow from these foul Xenos weapons, and though a Primarch, he'd felt his body aged. This campaign had left the Iron Warriors fleet nearly shattered. All of this suffering for a useless piece of real space his own brothers said was not worth sacrificing their legions for. All in the name of the Emperor, who had retreated to terror and granted Horus the position of War Master. Perturabo's wounds and suffering, his legion giving their blood, it meant nothing. A near century of constant warfare. Perturabo and his legion had seen the worst the galaxy had to offer and were now a force of grizzled veterans. The Primarch was at a low point though. His legion was in shambles after the Hrud. The soldiers exhausted and desensitized and their Primarch was angry. Angry that he had been put in this position. Then the worst news of all came. Olympia was in rebellion. Generations of families had given up their sons, never to see them again, as they died in brutal conflicts far from home. The schools were empty, the homes were quiet. This was a world celebrated for its renowned architecture, its technology, its bustling unique city cultures, and in its time under the Imperium, its resources and people were now barren. Perturabo was struck with intense anger and shame. Of all his brothers, his homeworld had rebelled. The embarrassment was immense. What would they think of the great Perturabo, the Hammer of Olympia? Ruggled Dawn would never have suffered this mistake, this weakness. What would the Empress say? The Primarch organized his legion, and lit by the anger caused by great shame, they plotted a course back to Olympia. The cold and calculating demigod was filled with rage. Upon his arrival in the system, the Olympians sent diplomats to negotiate with the Primarch, relying on what they had always tried, scheming and manipulating. Perturabo was done. He saw again the eyes of vipers, the ones who in his youth saw him as a tool to be exploited, to be used. We all despise those who hurt us, the ones who in life make us feel weak, like we mean nothing, the ones who talk about us behind our back. Perturabo in truth hated all of them. He hated the nobles, the people, and in a way he hated his sons because they never cared, they never loved him. This emotion inside the Primarch unbalanced him. It made him feel in ways that left him vulnerable, left him weak. And all this weakness must be purged. Iron within, iron without. Just as with the Legion, Perturabo ordered decimation on the entire world of Olympia. The Legion descended. Bombardments and drop pods rained from the skies, landing amongst the very fortresses and bastions the Primarch had built during his youth under Damikos. The world burned. The Astartes of the Iron Warriors had endured so much under their Primarch. The decimation, the mind-numbingly brutal conflicts and now they were purging their very home. The boys who had grown up in these very cities, who had laughed and cried, trained, just to join the ranks of the greatest army in the galaxy, the fourth Legiones Astartes. City by city fell, the citizens purged by their increasingly reluctant iron warriors. Perhaps in truth, this all felt like vengeance. The punishment for the world that had treated the Primarch so poorly Perturabo was lost in his anger, and millions would suffer for it. Staring on in his cold anger, Perturabo saved Locos for last, the home he had been raised in, 
the place he'd built from a warring city-state to an empire. There he went to confront the leader of this rebellion, Caliphon, his elderly foster sister, the family he rejected so long ago. With the thud of a giant, Perturabo entered the throne room. The elderly Caliphone, augmented and altered to extend her life, was now a frail old woman, but her mind was still sharp, and her words just as venomous. For a long time, I thought you a fool to follow the Emperor. After all, he is a tyrant, like all the rest. Look what he has done to you, I thought. He has brutalized you, and your wars have brutalized your home. But the truth is, brother, I have followed your campaigns carefully, and I noticed a pattern that disturbed and then alarmed me. Always you do things the most difficult way and in the most painful manner. You cultivate a martyr's complex, lurching from man to man, holding out your bleeding wrists so they might see how you hurt yourself. You brood in the shadows when all you want to do is scream, look at me. You are too arrogant to win people over through effort. You expect people to notice you there in the half darkness and point and shout out, there, there is the great Perturabo. See how he labors without complaint. You came to this court as a precocious child your abilities were so prodigious that nobody stopped to look at what you were becoming. She got shakily to her feet, exoskeletal braces whirred under her skirts. Perturabo, this will anger you, but you never truly grew into a man. I am not a man, he said. I am far more. In those words is the poison that spoils your potential. It is not the Emperor who has driven this world into rebellion. It is not he who has held it back. It is you and your woeful egotism. Let me tell you, my brother, you who affects to despise love so much, yet must certainly crave it over all other things. You are the biggest fool I have ever met. With a cry of anger, Perturabo lunged forwards and grasped her by the throat. He raised her up until she was level with his eyes. She grabbed weakly at his wrist. Her mouth gasped for air. I am far from a fool, sister, he said. I wished for more from life. I hoped to build a better world for people. I have found that there is only brutality. Whether the court intrigues of the tyrants or this war to conquer the stars, it is all the same. Violence is the constant of human existence. She choked. It need not be. That is the violence within you speaking. No, 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 he said smoothly. I know my own limitations. My temper does not cloud my judgment. It focuses it. Humanity is venal and fractious. It can never be governed as one. Everything else is an impossible dream. There is no peace. There is no goodness. He stroked away the hair from his sister's face with one hand as he strangled her with the other. And in such a flawed universe, there can be no mercy for traitors. She choked, trying and failing to speak. Coldly, Perturabo squeezed the life from her. You have lived long enough. She kept her eyes locked with his as he throttled her, even as her clawing hands became more desperate and a dreadful clicking sounded in her throat. She stared into his soul. What he saw reflected in her eyes was not fear, not loathing, but pity. With a last minor effort, he crushed her neck. Her eyes rolled back to show the whites, and she judged him no more. He stared at her in hatred a moment, wavering on the brink of tearing her body to pieces. But a sob escaped his mouth unexpectedly, and he gently lowered her back into her throne. Her head lolled on its broken neck, 
Warning chimes peeped insistently from the augmetics concealed in her skirt. A trickle of blood ran from her mouth. Appalled at what he had done, Perturabo turned away. He murdered her. He killed his own family with his bare hands. I think he realized that he was wrong. There were people who cared about him. People who saw how magnificent he was. And he was blind to it. Caliphon was right about him. No one had forced him to be a slave to tyrants. He chose it. He put himself through the most brutal conflicts in the galaxy. He had offered it willingly. All in the name of receiving praise as the strongest. The legion, the man, without weakness. For the second time in his life, Perturabo cried. Not tears of joy for when he met his father, but tears of pain and shame. He murdered his own family and purged his home because of his insecurities. The Primarch became gripped with fear. How was the Emperor ever going to forgive this atrocity? But nothing came. No censure, no punishment, no justice. In fact, just nothing. Perturabo had done something unforgivable, only to be met with silence. No one cared. The Emperor didn't care. It was just another securing of a non-compliant world. Perturabo was made to build and protect, to create a future for humanity. But how was the Emperor any different from Damikos? From the nobles of Olympia, he was just another uncaring tyrant. It was at Perturabo's lowest point when Horus came to him. The War Master, already corrupted by chaos, began to whisper in his ear, You are right about the Emperor. He is an unjust tyrant. Serve me and I will acknowledge you. Your gifts, your genius, your strength. The Emperor has lied to us. He has lied about the war. I will forgive you for your atrocities, brother. Perturabo was vulnerable. He hated more than anything to be vulnerable, to be weak. Perturabo pledged his service to Horus and betrayed the Imperium. With the betrayal of Horus at the infamous Isfahan III massacre revealed, the Emperor had ordered the Iron Warriors and six other legions to destroy the four traitor legions from the world of Isfahan V. A battle that could only be described as apocalyptic begun upon the world, with the Iron Hands, Salamanders and Raven Guard attacking in the first wave. The battle was titanic and brutal. Warriors that had fought over a century by each other's side shattered their bonds in a maelstrom of hatred. The first wave began to retreat and the three legions called upon their reinforcements. The Iron Warriors, Night Lords, word bearers and alpha legion, but they remained silent. It was in the silence that their realization came and the four legions unleashed a barrage upon the three loyalist legions, decimating them. Perturabo finished it by launching a nucleonic missile straight at his brother Vulcan of the Salamanders, killing thousands. It did not matter. They were tools of a tyrant. It wasn't personal. Only Horus and his forgiveness mattered. In celebration of this victory, Horus granted Perturabo Forgebreaker, the hammer Fulgrim had forged for Ferris long ago as a sign of his office and commitment to the War Master, a leader who would value him. Perturabo had felt weak. He needed to claim back his pride and strength, and it would be the fools loyal to the tyrant emperor who would suffer, especially the one who had taken away his purpose of praise, Rogel Dawn. The Iron Warriors and Perturabo unleashed their fury. World after world fell to the traitors as the years of the heresy progress. Perturabo destroying bastions raised by the Imperial Fists, such as the world of Hydra Cordatus. Perturabo was beginning to feel strong again, and billions would suffer for it. For years, the heresy rages across the Imperium. Perturabo and the traitors began to devolve. The purging of Olympia had broken him and the Legion. Now, they were remade into warriors, bereft of humanity. 
Their strength only increased as they became aware of the powers in the warp. Percy Rabo had no desire to serve any gods, but the powers of the warp were intriguing. Following the slaughter at Hydra Cordatus, Fulgrim of the Emperor's children approached the Lord of Iron. He offered gifts, such as a necklace called the Maljata Stone, and spoke of a weapon called the Angel Exterminatus, a tool to boost their power immeasurably. Fulgrim was obsessed with being the perfect warrior, something that struck a chord with the Lord of Iron. This long ago had created a bond of respect between the two, perhaps not as friends, but definitely as brothers. Perturabo agreed, and the two legions set out to the Eye of Terror, the very warp tear that had filled the Primarch with paranoia as a child. Making their way through the warp storms, the legion attacked the bastion that held the weapon, a dilapidated crone world of the Eldar. The legion broke through, only for Fulgrim to go missing. Suspicious, Perturabo followed deeper into the bastion, until there he saw him. Fulgrim, smiling. Perturabo fell to the ground. The gift Fulgrim had given him was a betrayal. The Maljata stone brought the Primarch to his knees. It was draining his very essence away. Fulgrim had sold his soul to the powers of the warp, and he was going to sacrifice Perturabo to achieve demonhood. Fulgrim laughed maniacally, chastising the foolishness of Perturabo. How could he ignore the truth of the Dark Gods? Mankind has no need of gods, said Perturabo. We outgrew them a long time ago. Fulgrim laughed, though Perturabo saw that the effort of holding his swelling body together was taking every ounce of his concentration. Beads of light, mercury bright, sweated from his skin, dripping from the cruciform stance in silver droplets. Thank you, sir. Then why are there still gods? Belief empowers them, and we worship them in every act of slaughter, betrayal, depravity, and quest for immortality we undertake. Whether we know it or not, we offer them fealty every day. Perturabo shook his head. I worship nothing. I believe in nothing. The finality of the last utterance almost stopped him in his tracks. The force of it was like a blow, a bitter seed of truth he had never acknowledged or known until this moment. He saw the awareness of it reflected in Fulgrim's eyes. And that is why you live a stale, bitter life, said Fulgrim, contempt and pity dripping from his scornful words. You let yourself be abused, crushed into slavery by a god who doesn't even have the decency to admit what he is. Our once father ascended to godhood long ago and denies others their place at the table. He promised us a new world to live in, but he was always to be above us, the master with his loyal lapdog slaves. Is that why you sided with Horus? demanded Perturabo. Standing right in front of Fulgrim, his enraged features so close that none could come between them. Jealousy, vanity, such pettiness is for the weak. We were made for greater things. What would you know of greater things? Sneered Fulgrim. You don't know the things I dream, said Perturabo. No one does. No one ever cared enough to find out. Fulgrim's head shot forwards and a mask of glittering vapor, pink and veined with arterial red, blew from his open mouth enveloping Perturabo in its astrogant reek, part perfume, part cesspit. Then show me your dreams, brother, and let me make them real. Fulgrim forced his way into his mind and saw the vision that Perturado had dreamed every night since leaving Olympia. Paradise. A world of marble mountains and luscious trees. Cities designed in utter perfect detail, each distinct and luxurious, in dedication to learning, culture, art, technology and wisdom. A world where Perturabo was a creator, a scholar, 
a place with no wall. Perturabo strode along the perfect walkways and felt the love of the people. They lauded his genius and works. He had created paradise, and it was he who protected it. All Perturabo wanted was to create and to feel loved. No tyrants, no manipulators, a future without blemish or weakness. Ripped back into reality, Fulgrim's ritual was interrupted by a ragtag group of loyalists, who in their ambush destroyed the Maljata stone, freeing the Primarch. Feeling his strength return, Perturabo looked one last time into Fulgrim's eyes and saw nothing of the brother he knew. He raised Dawnbreaker and smashed Fulgrim with a blow that could level a mountain, but it was too late, and Fulgrim burst into primordial flame, transforming into a demon Primarch. Wounded physically and spiritually, Perturabo and his legion retreated. The events of the Angel Exterminatus began another shift in the mind of the Lord of Iron. He had almost died to a brother who should have been his ally. His brothers were changing. The early days of the heresy were about toppling the tyrant who had used them as tools for an empire that was doomed to fail. But as the years of the heresy progressed, they were changing. The word bearers of Lorgar had bonded some of their warriors to denizens of the warp. The Emperor's children almost looked unrecognizable with their body modifications. Brutal conflicts, titanic sieges, the heresy kept progressing pushing back the loyalists, and Perturabo could see his brothers become more and more twisted by the powers of the Immaterium. Even Grandfather Nurgle came directly to the Iron Warriors, in the form of the Lost Sons of Horus legionary Karlek. This bloated and corrupted marine spoke to Perturabo. The Plague Father offers him a crown. He offers him power, and he offers immortality. For somehow the corrupted marine knew Perturabo was dying. The ritual of the Angel Exterminatus had wounded his soul, and the Lord of Iron was dying slowly. In truth, Perturabo knew this too. He had already begun to augment his body and armor, furthering it almost into a life support system. Karlek told him that his strength was failing, he was weak, and that if he ever faced his brother Angron, he would die. Perturabo gave his answer, and destroyed Karlek and his twisted followers. They had made a mistake. They all had. It was the mistake of both the loyalists and the traitors. They had underestimated Perturabo. The Lord of Iron and his legion's heart had grown dark. They betrayed the Imperium and burned worlds. They had learned the truth of the warp and began to study it. Perturabo had seen how his brothers were becoming tools of warp entities. Fulgrim's betrayal had hardened his heart. No longer would he suffer the weakness of shame. The destruction of Olympia now meant nothing to him. Like the child who burns down the village to feel its warmth, Perturabo had burned his home as vengeance for the love he felt they denied him. But he no longer needed that love. Caliphone had been right. He was always desperate for approval but he no longer needed the Emperor's approval. Perturabo had begun to purge the weakness in his heart. Iron within, iron without. Warmaster Horus assembled Perturabo and Lorgar. Terror was within their sights, and the Imperial Tyrant would be destroyed. But the effects of Chaos Corruption on the other legions had turned them into more of a rabble rather than a legion. Lorgar was sent to bring the demon Primarch Fulgrim. As for Perturabo, he was ordered to muster the now cornate demon Primarch Angron to assemble to assault the solar system, and then terror. Was this the death Chaos had predicted? No. Perturabo's greatest weapon had always been his mind, a tool sharpened with over a century of warfare, combined with his inbuilt genius and now new knowledge of warcraft. Perturabo assembled his iron warriors upon a hill on the planet Deluge and waited. The World Eaters came, not a disciplined legion, but a screaming host of corrupted marines, led by the demonic beast Angron. Volleys railed from the iron warriors, obliterating the World Eaters. As Angron's bloodlust was uncontrollable, he rushed in, 
right into the Lord of Iron's trap. It was no duel. It was a tamer reeling in his beast. You think I am weak? Perturabo's voice boomed over the grill of his helm. Angron struck him twice again. Splinters of the metal fell from the Lord of Iron as he staggered once more. But you have grown weaker, Angron. The demon Primarch lashed a kick into Perturabo and struck once, twice, three times as the Lord of Iron stumbled back and crashed to his knees. I have learnt. I have remade my strength while you have sold yours out of despair. Argonis heard the words, heard the spite in them, the cold bitterness. There was something else there too, something that made Argonis think of the knife jewels in the dark warrens of Chthonia. Cuts meant to goad, not kill. Angron roared, and in the fraction of time that gave, Perturabo was on his feet, Forgebreaker moving faster than before. The air shook as its head struck and struck again, and there was blood on the baked mud of the ground beneath the two. Angron was scattering burning blood and broken armor. He lashed a fist at Perturabo. Claws tore the front of the Lord of Iron's helm. Perturabo's skin was pale gray, streaked with blood beneath. You are weak, snarled Perturabo. You are a slave. You were born a slave, and a slave you remain. Angron cut Perturabo. Argonis did not see it done, just the Lord of Iron suddenly still. A crimson trail running down his chest, and glowing gashes smiling across his torso. Angron was striking again, but somehow he seemed to be shrinking. The edges of his shadow and flame bulk retreating like a wave from the shore. Perturabo struck back, and hammer and axe met. Your strength flees! Roared Perturabo. It does not belong to you. It is your master's, and the chain that keeps you throttles you. The threads of blood are thinning. The meal of slaughter will only keep you here long enough to see your bastard sons die. Angron turned towards the circle of Ortima surrounding them. His axe lashed out, burning gouges across the front of the circles of shields again and again scoring deep. Their skin is my skin, called Perturabo. A gift of suffering at the hands of our brother. He was walking towards Angron, limping, but hammer in hand. You think that I would let your kind wield your weapons against me? I have taken their measure. Angron whirled, wings extending to carry him back at his brother. Perturabo raised his hands, weapon pods unfolding from his armored shell. Angron's tattered shadow wings beat. Perturabo fired. Streams of energy and exotic rounds blazed across the space between the two. Fire and explosions wreathed Angron. Ectoplasmic smoke billowed off him. His wings were broken frames of bone, draped with scrapes of skin. Perturabo came forward as he kept up the fusillade. Each step a slow thud of braced pistons. They will die, here, on this hill. They will die without striking a blow. All of your best mongrel sons of slaughter, they will die. And your battered soul will watch as it fades back into the dark. Perturabo defeated Angron, a demon Primarch. All that world-bending power is meaningless if uncontrollable and not paired with an equally powerful intellect. Reeling from the mess that was the World Eaters Legion, the remaining traitors gathered for the final assault upon the solar system, and then terror itself. Perturabo's power had grown, his augmetics, his warcraft knowledge, but most importantly, his emotional stability. The boy, so desperate for approval, had hardened his heart. He didn't really need to prove anything to anyone other than himself. The closeness he had felt for Horus in the beginning of the heresy had begun to fade. Since Horus had re-emerged from the warp on the world of Molech, he was different. The Warmaster had been gone for mere moments, but emerged significantly older. Something fundamental had changed in Horus. 
he was difficult to reach, delegating commands to Abaddon, a mere marine. He no longer took counsel with his brothers. He spoke to the dark gods of the warp as divine masters. Perturabu again was finding himself in the very situation he was fighting against, being used as a tool underneath a tyrant. You can imagine how uneasy this feeling may have been. Perturabu betrayed his father, the Imperium, and half of his brothers for Horus, who now seemed to be just a replacement rather than a liberator. The ties of loyalty between the traitors was falling apart. Perhaps the only real thing left between them was the fear of retaliation. The traitor forces slammed into the solar system, millions of rebellious and corrupted forces fighting tooth and nail against the proactive defense of the loyalists. Now came the test, the siege expertise of Perturabo versus the fortifications of Rogal Dawn, a chance to put this old rivalry to the test. Brutal naval conflicts, bitter ground deployments, and titanic clashes raged as the forces met. Slowly the traitors pushed forward, getting closer and closer to the Imperial Palace, but cracks between the traitors just grew. Fulgrim and his Seleshi corrupted legion were more interested in capturing slaves. Mortarian and his Death Guard were just throwing poxes at the psychic defenses of the Imperial Palace. Magnus and his Thousand Sons were missing. It had become clear to Perturabo that he was the only sane traitor actually involved on the ground level, though in truth he was not much better. In the battle for the Lion's Gate spaceport, he even willingly sacrificed his own sons to buy time, like how a king on a chessboard uses his pawns. Though not corrupted by chaos, Perturabo was, and always had been, cold and calculating and it was clear at this point his legion was simply resources to use in his goals. The traitors now were so close, no thanks to the efforts of Perturabo. The battle of feints, assaults, sallies and bombardments between the Lord of Iron and Rogal Dawn were a bitter duel of the brilliant minds. Piece by piece, the traitors were closer to domination. But was this the victory he wanted? He was deposing a tyrant only now to replace him with another. Horus was using him. He had seen the difference between Horus and his brothers. Whilst they were uncontrollable and pathetic, Horus was powerful and disciplined. Even his aura almost pushed him to his knees. But Horus had just become another servant, rather than using his power as an augmentation. Just like in Fulgrim's eyes, Perturabo could see there was nothing truly left of his brother. The call was sent. The Iron Warriors Legion reassembled and abandoned the Siege of Terror. Damned if he stayed, damned if he left, but so be it. He would prepare for the wars to come. We all change. Look back five years, and at times that person can be unrecognizable. Perturabo had lived nearly two centuries, and is almost completely unrecognizable after the Horus heresy. From that boy, all alone in the mountains having to survive and adapt, to the naive man growing up in the court of Damikos, being taken advantage of, never connecting with anyone, paranoid about the tear in the sky no one else could see, being insecure about showing any signs of failure or weakness to meeting the Emperor and finally feeling love, connection and purpose for all of it to turn bitter as his accomplishments, his dedication and suffering were ignored. Consumed by jealousy, hatred and shame, he burned his homeworld and murdered his foster family and when he awoke from that haze, he was consumed by guilt, something his own brother took advantage of and offered him salvation, in return for dethroning the tyrant who used him just like the Olympians. Perturavo joined Horus, and pushed the loyalists all the way to terror, but on that journey his heart hardened. The betrayal of Fulgrim, the mortal wound, seeing his brothers becoming enslaved to warp entities. By the time they had reached terror, only he and Horus were still remarkably sane. But Horus had changed too, 
and turned into an uncaring tyrant, just like their father. What did Perturabo want? He had long dreamed of Utopia, a domain where he was a scholar, a creator, a place where he wasn't weak, but powerful. By turning his back on Horus, he had overcome his greatest weakness, the need for others' approval. He had seen how his brothers like Angron and Fulgrim were enslaved to the Dark Gods, undisciplined and insane. But most importantly, he was dying, slowly bleeding strength. The greatest weakness of all is failure. Death is failure. Shortly after the abandonment of the siege, the news came. Horus was dead, the Emperor was crippled, but the Loyalists had won, and they were coming for the traitor legions, and so Perturabo prepared. On the world of Sebastus IV, the Iron Warriors created the Eternal Fortress, a near impregnable bastion that looked like an eight pointed star of chaos. It was a trap, designed to lure one whose rivalry was never truly settled, Rogal Dawn. The Praetorian of Terror, consumed by despair in what had become of the Emperor, declared he would dig Perturabo out of his hole and bring him back to Terror in an iron cage. The battle between the two legions begun, a brutal slog between the greatest siege experts known to man, but Rogal Dawn since Terror was a broken man and the battle became a pseudo punishment for his legion. As they pushed further and further, caring nothing for casualties, until the trap was sprung. Perturabo and the Iron Warriors turned it from a siege into a prison, cutting off the Imperial Fist from the outside. It was a slaughter, and would have been the end for them if not for the untimely intervention of the Ultramarines. But the battle was done. Perturabo had shown his superiority and left with his victory. But now there was one last opponent to defeat. Death. Perturabo during the heresy had seen his brothers, how dedication to one of the dark gods left you a slave to their whims. But what if you were dedicated to all? What if the dark gods had to come to him? What if they fought for his attention against each other? He had studied the warp. None of the others, not even Horus understood it like he did. Chaos could be the tool to augment his power to an untouchable level. They could prevent his death, his failure. He made his choice. The gene seed of over 400 Imperial Fists, captured by the Iron Warriors in the Iron Cage, was sacrificed to the Dark Gods. Perturabo was elevated to the rank of Demon Prince, of Chaos Undivided. He was given a world, a domain to call his own, a place to create Utopia. The journey of Perturabo is tragic. It is almost fitting that the material he found resonance with is iron, because in reality we all know that iron is brittle. Perturabo was a genius, gifted and powerful, but his heart was his greatest weakness. The absence of love in his life is the crux of all the pain he put himself through. His real weakness was the fact that he could not accept weakness itself. Unable to share them, bottles it up inside until it turns to resentment and hate. He created perhaps the deadliest legion in the Imperium, created the best technology, devised the greatest strategies, a true titan of physical and mental prowess. He even became an immortal demon, but he is alone. Men who have iron within don't have the strength to love anything, and the greatest tragedy in this universe is to live life without love.